Boeing's response was to blame, was to was to was, was to blame sort of other folks. And and so all of this, though, the key thing is all of this was downstream from not just building a new airplane, which is what they should have done. And the funny thing is, is in the meantime, Airbus did redesign the A320, which was their big one to the, the, the A321, the A321 uh, and Neo. And because they did a, a, a new design and, and because they could fully embrace these super efficient engines, right? the 321 Neo is obliterating Boeing. The 737 was, was like the best selling p- plane for years and years and years. Today, they can still sell because it's a duopoly and th- it's the plane that everyone needs. If you want to get the 321 or the 321 Neo, you have to wait years and years. Losing out to the French here. This is bullshit. Yeah. No, it, 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 there used to be it used to be a sort of thing like, oh, I'd rather fly Boeing, not trusting Airbus. Now it's it's it's. I would argue it's probably the opposite. But from a market perspective, the great irony is that Boeing wanted to make sure they lost the market anyway, and, and it's it's another debacle like the, like the 787 for many of, of the same reasons, but a different driver. Yeah. Anyhow, no, we I, haven't even gotten to this week. <laughs> well, we can, we can circle back to this week in a minute. I just want to add number one, when you talk about the lack of airplane accidents in the U S um, and just the general expertise that has emerged in engineering airplanes. Uh, I think back to the flight at Haneda that was engulfed in flames and everybody walked off safely um, a couple weeks ago. And that's sort of the other side of this story. Nobody was hurt in the Alaska Airlines incident either. But the fact that they have learned from past incidents to be able to secure a flight, even as the entire plane is lit on fire, is unbelievable to me and and a, a credit to the way the entire industry has paid attention to past mistakes and then also just the regulation that has been effective at making planes safer and safer with each passing decade. So that's well, what great. Are the, one of the takeaways from the Haneda, not to sort of uh, uh, divert, but one of the takeaways from there is, number one, you're supposed to be able to clear a plane, I believe, in less than five minutes uh, mm-hmm. f- using only three, like three-eighths of the exits is because is some might be compromised or whatever. It did actually take them uh 17 or 18 minutes or something like that to evacuate the plane so that ended up being sufficiently fast but it was there is a bit of a wake up call that that can we get up with on it up? that response time. and by okay. the way um you know what do you call it you know everyone did leave their carry on baggage behind there's been some tests or some issues of like if you're if you need to get out of the plane don't grab a bag and there is real concern that uh in a similar scenario in Maybe the U.S. The US uh, <laughs> people would have tried to grab <laughs> grab their bag, and so the two takeaways here are: look, listen to the listen to the flight attendants, save your buckle life, up, leave the bag, and leave the bag. <laughs> like that that is that is the, the two less sort of lessons listen, of the year. If you learn nothing else from today's sharp tech, leave the goddamn carry on on the flight if the flight happens to be engulfed in flames, yes. and fasten your seatbelt because you never know one of these door plugs might just fly off. Um, at however, I, I, I the story would have been different if it had done that at thirty thousand feet. So it's lucky that it happened as they were ascending. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of luck, and there's been a lot of like issues about like potential collisions over the last couple of years. Um, it, yeah. It, there it's a real concern like i i i fly a lot like i it, it is not it is, it is disconcerting to in say my the seat least. here a little bit uneasy um another aspect of the boeing story is that boeing put a lot of pressure on its people internally to deliver the max despite some of the software concerns that were expressed and, right so so Yes. Yes. So and, and that's again the, the the finance sort of the finance tail wagging the dog to yes, some degree. And, absolutely. Um, it's it's sort of the theme with all of the disasters over the last twenty five years. Well, so the, the, that brings us to the current one. So what is so disconcerting about this one is f- say what you you there's understandable drivers to the the previous Max episode. You could understand why they wanted to use the air, airframe one more time. You could understand why they wanted it to fly like an NG. And you can understand software bugs. Like, like, And at the end of the day, they were able to recover and fix it, mostly primarily by fixing the software. There was new pilot training that needed to happen and things like that. 
But there is, it's not great. None of it was great. It should have never gotten to that situation and hundreds of people died because of it. But mm -hmm. there is, at least from my perspective, to at least understand how it happened is somewhat comforting, right? Like, and and, the, and not just from a bug perspective, but what were the incentive structures that went into making this making this work? Okay. The reason why I find what happened this week with this door and with these inspections so disconcerting is this was just incompetence. It the the bolts were not put in correctly. Then they were shipped to Boeing. Boeing was supposed to invest it, was supposed to inspect it before they put the panel on top of it. The inspection failed. You had multiple steps in the chain that wasn't a finance driven decision. That wasn't a bug in software. That was just people not doing their jobs. Yep. And now I would well, that, certainly look, argue that's the that aspect all this of the story. It just gets so sad because this was one of the flagship American companies. Exactly. And it, you take it, a step back and just the entire company is just worse and less effective and less competent than it was 30 years ago. And, and this and, is the it's downstream effect of it. This comes from the top for sure. But when you build a great company, the top can be bad for quite a while. And there is going to be the core of the company that is still excellent, that mm -hmm. still cares, that still does a good job. And, and what is so worrisome about this is if it, it, it's evidence that the rot has gone very, very deep. It's right. now now people on the line just don't don't care or not doing their job. And and the, what you suspect is now the leadership is going to go down and make, you know, scapegoats out of someone or something or other or X, Y, Z. But the reality is, is this rot started from the top. It, it, and it has been filtering down for a long time. And it, it's, it started with the screw up with the 787, which was a strategic management decision. Mm -hmm. Then it went to the 737, the software, which was a centralized, the software is like, it, 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 that is, that's like the middle layer. It's like the infrastructure layer of the airplane. That went bad. And now it's gone all the way to the bottom where the, where people on the line are not doing their job. And you, you, it, number one, it's nerve wracking. I fly on Boeing planes all the time. Number two, this is why it is interesting about a, a broader object lesson or question about competence of, about america like right when American you're a great when you're a great company or, or when you're a great country you stuff will keep working for a very very long time even if rot has set in it takes time for rot to filter down the question though is if the rot is already started can it be arrested can it be stopped how do you go back how do you make boeing again how do you make boeing great again that and is ultimately the, the question in a lot of different areas, because we need to restore our ability to make things and build things in this country. And um, it's it takes decades to ruin and it probably takes decades for yep. some of that to regenerate. And I think recognizing some of the problems is, I, I guess, a first step to be super cliche about it. Um but to put a finer point on some of what's being described here, because I do think ultimately this it comes back to our theme about qualities of businesses that are difficult to measure, but are no less important because they're harder to see on a spreadsheet. And so the culture aspect of this, it, it, it it's hard to sort of put that on a balance sheet. Um, but David Gels, a New York Times writer who covered Boeing, he was interviewed in 2021. And I've just been fascinated reading about some of the history here. I'll put some of the links in the show notes. But he writes, um, Boeing was a culture that for the better part of a century had really been focused on engineering and run by engineers. I think as recently as the 70s and 80s, the CFO famously didn't even have that much interaction with some of the institutional shareholders. Boeing was really regarded as an engineering first company that was going to produce its best airplanes and the shareholders would get a fair return. But it wasn't a company that was being run for quarterly profits. That did start to change with the arrival of executives from McDonnell Douglas, who themselves had come from GE, where they had studied with Jack Welsh. While cautioning, this is further down, while cautioning that, quote, we have to be careful not to draw too broad of conclusions from the examples at one company in particular, Gell says. Gell says that, 
it's also true that Boeing, like many, many publicly traded companies in the country, put a premium on satisfying its shareholders. Many would argue that decision by decision, executive by executive, the results of that at the end of the day were inferior checks and balances inside the company, a culture that promoted short-term profitability over long-term quality, and that it was the kind it, and that it was that kind of culture where the 737 Max was created with what was ultimately a really fatal flaw. And to be clear, the fatal flaw that he's talking about is the last fatal flaw, not the current right. fatal flaw. <laughs> Here we are again, another mess. I also want to highlight an article by a, a writer named Jerry Useem. He had a piece about Boeing in the Atlantic a few years ago, again, with the previous Max disaster. And it starts with a scene in 2001 where the Boeing leadership at that point is taking off in a jet and there are three separate flight plans to Denver, Dallas, and Chicago, and nobody on the ground knows where the plane is going. And it's this big surprise because they're announcing the new corporate headquarters. So it's it's like a high school recruiting announcement where the guy has three hats <laughs> on the table. Yes. <laughs> um, just a great scene to open with. And then in terms of what actually happened, I'll read from the article. Uh, Yusim writes, Boeing's top management staff, roughly 500 people in all, would work in Chicago, but the nearest Boeing commercial airplane assembly facility would be 1,700 miles away. And then they have this quote, Bill Condit, who was CEO at the time, says, quote, when the headquarters is located in proximity to a principal business, as ours was in Seattle, the corporate center is inevitably drawn into day-to-day -day business operations. So I'm sure what, that there are that's pluses an, and minuses. That's to, an astounding statement. Yes. Because he's um, listing that as a negative. It signifies it's like it's everything bad that has to be in Seattle because we get too involved with day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. It's it's and, staggering. 